Good morning and welcome to Bookham Baptist Church online service this morning. My name is Jill Hawkins. I'm one of the ministers at the church and later we're going to hear from Caroline, another of the ministers who's going to bring the word. We have Mark Hopley leading worship and I've actually done an all age spot, a little bit out of my comfort zone. Our theme that we're continuing with this week is how then shall we live? And we're going to dig down into one of the challenging commandments, you shall not commit adultery or live faithfully. So we're going to be looking at the theme of faithfulness this week. Let's remember that though we can't be together and present to one another, God can be present to us. Wherever we are, whether you're on your own or with family, God can be present with you here now, do remember that there is a Zoom chat immediately following the service at half past 11, and you'll find the link for that in the description below this video. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we invite you to come and be present with us now, to make your presence known to us wherever we are. We thank you, Lord, for that great gift that we can know for sure. Your presence closer than a brother in each of our homes right now. So help us, Lord, in this moment of silence to know your revealed presence. Lord, we give this time to you. We want to bring our worship to you. We want to open our hearts to hear your word. We ask, Lord, that you would mould and shape us this morning. We ask that our worship would be acceptable to you, that you would enjoy being with us this morning as we enjoy being with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, Mark Hopley is going to lead us in some worship and then we'll enjoy the all-age spot together. Running out 
have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Hello. Now we're continuing our series this morning in how then shall we live? And we've got a kind of a long word that we're focusing on, and that is the word faithfulness. So if you're on your own, I want you just to have a little think about it and what you think that means. If you're sitting in family groups, then I'm going to go over there and I'm going to water my pots. And while I'm watering my pots, just have a little conversation about what you think the word faithfulness means. Now, I'm in my gardening gloves, I'm using my watering can, and that's not an accident. And the reason is that, although I've thought about faithfulness a lot in my life, I've been learning some new things about faithfulness. So I'm going to show you over here. Some seedlings. These are about a month old. I put the seeds into the soil and then I put them on my windowsill and I began to wait. But the compost dried up really quickly inside. We had some hot days and it got really hot. It got really dry. And so the compost dried up and I quickly realised that if I didn't give it water every day, nothing was going to happen. But quite quickly after I began to water it, up came these seedlings and they're going to become foxgloves which are big tall plants and they'll be all different colours, beautiful flowers. I'm not much of a gardener really but I'm learning that faithfulness produces beauty. When I planted up this pot a few weeks ago it was just little green plants but I've given it water every dry day and look at these beautiful blue flowers. And this one, white and blue. And that one, these are just coming out, the geraniums, and they've got a lovely smell. You can't smell them, but they've got a lovely smell. And look up here too. I love my hanging baskets. I've put blue and white, and they're just beautiful. And the reason that they're beautiful is faithfulness. Every time they began to get a little bit dry, I went round the back, I filled my watering can and I gave them some water. And so they've produced all this blossom. And so I'm learning how to be a faithful gardener. God's given me this garden and I want to see all the beautiful things that it's going to produce, but I need to do my part to look after it. And we can think of lots of areas of our lives where we can be faithful. We can be faithful children to our parents. Say good things about mum and dad. Be obedient when we're asked to do something. And it's the same in my marriage. Even on days when Phil and I aren't really getting on very well, if we can find the faithfulness to say kind things to each other, to be forgiving, then what happens is it's like pouring water on the seeds. We're pouring water on our marriage and what is produced is something I think is quite beautiful. And that's our All Age talk for today. Bye. I thank myself now for the All Age spot. I hope you enjoyed that. And now Mark is going to continue to lead us in some worship. Mark. He's coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise Who can stop 
So along um, our theme of faithfulness, we come now to the moment of our offering and ask the question, are we faithful in what we offer to God? We offer all sorts of things to God, not just our money. And this is a moment for us really to be cognizant of what we offer. We're offering our time and attention right now. Maybe we offer our time and attention during the week as we go to work or work from home? Are we attentive to what God is saying to us and prompting us with through the week as we interact with colleagues and family and friends? We bring a gift often of our, um, uh, an offering of who we are, the gifts that we have to God. We lay those before him. But this moment is a time for us to consider how we financially are faithful to God. So if you um, give by standing order, then this is a moment just to be aware of that, to offer that to God. He knows that that's how you give. If you give um, using the gift app, this is the time to call it up on your phone and um, make your offering. So let's pray now, um, both about God's provision for us um, and also I want to pray for the church in the United Kingdom 
Many of you will know that there are churches opening today for the first time. And we want to just pray for uh, God's sustaining power and safety for the church across our nation. So let's pray now. Father, we bless you for the way you provide for us from your abundance. We recall to mind that we do not own anything. You give us everything that we have as a grace gift in our lives. Our very breath is a grace gift from you. And so, Father, we bless you for your provision to us personally as individuals and as families. And we bless you for the provision that you've made to us as a church, which has enabled us to be so generous across the world and locally. Father, we ask that you would continue to provide for us in this way and you'd continue to give us wisdom in how we use the finances that you have given us. Father, we want to lift to you this morning the church in the United Kingdom. We have been offered new freedoms in recent days and yet they are constrained freedoms and rightly so. And so, Father, we particularly lift to you those churches that are making a brave and, and, and tentative move this morning to open their doors and to have people come in and worship together. Father, we ask that you would anoint the United Kingdom Church with inventiveness, that we would find new ways to worship you, that we would be uh, filled with new ideas and not always held back by our history and the way we've always done it. Father, we also pray for safety for those who make the move to go to a place of worship to worship you today, Father. We pray that you protect them, that there would be no more outbreak of COVID because of people seeking to come together to worship you. But Father, we also want to pray that this time of suffering that your nation has known would produce in us perseverance, that in our faith you would enable us to persevere in the mission that you've given us, to reach out to those around us who don't yet know you. Lord God, firm us in our spirits, move us in our spirits to, to understand what you've called us to as a church in this nation. Help us, Lord God, to be effective in speaking your love, your grace, your peace, your invitation out to those who don't yet know you. Now, Lord, as we come before your word, as Caroline opens your word to us, we bow our hearts before you and ask that you would help us to have receptive hearts for your truth. Let us be not only hearers, but doers of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Well, this morning we're continuing our series. We've been looking at Exodus since the beginning of January and we've been taking a slow walk through the wilderness in re recent weeks. Uh, for the last few weeks, we've been pausing at Mount Sinai where Moses was given the Ten Commandments by God. And this sort of mini series within a bigger series is called, How Then Shall We Live? And we're looking at the Ten Commandments in reverse order. Now, before we get to today's commandment, I want to remind you of the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Rob spoke to us really clearly about this a few weeks ago, and I found it very helpful myself. He was saying the Ten Commandments are a framework for freedom, that they're, they're a framework so that the people of God could enjoy and live in the freedom and the life and the fullness of life that God had won for them as he brought them out of slavery into the wilderness and eventually as they go into the promised land. And so I want you to hold that in your mind today as we look at this topic, because this can be a bit of a heavy one. So today we're looking at the seventh commandment, which is do not commit adultery. Now, you may hear that and think, OK, I'm not married. This doesn't this doesn't relate to me. Uh, just kind of switch off either physically or mentally. But I want to suggest that uh, 
infidelity or fidelity, faithfulness, applies to all of us. It applies to all of our relationships. And so although we're going to be looking specifically at marriage today, we are also going to think about what faithfulness looks like in our other relationships. Now, before we dive in, it's really important that we have clear in our mind what a biblical view of marriage and sex is. We live in a world where there is a kind of cultural understanding of marriage and a cultural understanding of sex and relationships, which is really quite different to what we read about in scripture. So if we don't get clear in our minds what God's view of marriage is, what God's view of sex is, then we're not gonna really understand what Jesus' teachings are really about. So I want to start off by saying that God loves sex. God loves marriage, that he has a very high view of these things. And in fact, the scriptures are bookmark, bookmarked by marriage. So if we look at creation in Genesis, Adam and Eve, we see marriage right there, right at the beginning. And then if we go to Revelation, again, we see marriage between Jesus and the church, that God kind of loves marriage, it is important. And actually, as I've been mulling on this, I've been reminded of what we call the statement of purpose. So whenever we gather for a, for a wedding, uh, if you're leading a wedding, you say some words. You might, have, you might be familiar with this if you've been a guest at a wedding. You know where the minister starts off by saying, we're gathered here today in the presence of God. And then he goes on, or she goes on to give quite a long, uh, I was going to say rambly, quite a long speech about what marriage is and what it isn't. And there's some really helpful words in there. So I'm going to read a few of these um, just for us to really understand what Christian marriage is and what it looks like. So this is a couple of paragraphs from the statement of purpose. God gives us marriage for the full expression of love between man and a woman. In marriage, a man and a woman belong to one another and with affection and tenderness, freely give themselves to each other. God gives us marriage for the well-being of human society, for the ordering of family life and for the birth and nurture of children. He gives us marriage as the holy mystery in which man and woman are joined together and become one, just as Christ is one with the church. Do you notice here how it doesn't say anything about being in love? It doesn't say anything about making one another happy. We don't see those words at all in this Christian understanding of marriage. And of course, we want those to be parts of marriage and they often are, those are important. But what's stated here is about, this is about the ordering of society. It's about the well-being of society. It's about the birth and nurture of children. It's about community. It's about pointing towards this mystery of the relationship between Jesus and the church. And that's what Christian marriage is. So it is more about than just these kind of romantic feelings of being in love. And also we believe that sex is powerful. In the contemporary world, uh, there's a message that sex is just a physical act. But we believe, and we can see from scripture, that it actually uh, involves the whole of our being, body, mind, and spirit. That it's a physical act, it's an emotional act, and it's a spiritual act. And because of that, it's incredibly powerful. And when it is channeled right, it can literally create life. Is there anything more powerful than that? But also when it's misused, when it's not channeled in the right way, it can destroy life. It can devastate families, it can devastate children and generations and communities. And so the Bible is very, very clear on this, that sex is a good gift from God, but only to be within a marriage relationship. So I want to move on now to think about what is infidelity. And we can see here, and in some ways it's quite encouraging to know that infidelity isn't just a modern problem. This was, these commandments were given four and a half, a thousand years ago, and clearly adultery was a problem then. It was maybe very clear what it was then, it was uh, sex outside of a marriage relationship. But today there's all this kind of ambiguity. We live in a society where things are a bit less clear. So what about things like sexting, using pornography, being in a relationship but still being on some dating apps or emotional affairs. These aren't quite so clear, but I want to suggest that they all come under the, the term of adultery. Now, you may or may not be familiar with a lady called Esther Perel. 
She is a Belgian therapist and author and lecturer, an expert, a world-renowned expert in relationships. She's not a Christian, but I found some of her work really helpful. And she's written a book called The State of Affairs, which is looking at the issue of infidelity. And she's responding to the fact that, that we do live in this more complex society where the things are less clear. But she gives three ingredients to what constitute infidelity. And she said it just takes one of these for someone to be unfaithful. So the first one is there's an element of secrecy. The second is there's some emotional involvement. And the third is that there's some sexual alchemy or attraction. And that if any of those things are present, that constitutes infidelity. So the reality here is if we look at infidelity in those terms, perhaps an emotional attachment that's not appropriate, perhaps some level of secrecy or dishonesty or some sort of attraction or, like I say, sexual alchemy, that the reality is that none of us are immune. And if we're really honest, that most, if not all of us, have been there at some point. So the question is, if infidelity is so devastating, I've already talked about what happens when things go wrong, then why do people do it? And how many times have you either seen on TV or maybe even had conversations with friends or family members who've said, I don't know how I ended up here? Well, the obvious answer is perhaps there's something lacking in, in a relationship or in a marriage. Perhaps there's some sort of unmet need. But interestingly, Esther Perel, this therapist I was talking about, she says often the marriage can be very happy, but it's an unmet need in the individual. That there's something in them which uh, feels like a longing or some need which is unmet. We're going to come back to that later. But I want to read now from scripture. And there's two stories we're going to be looking at, both involving Jesus. Um, we have heard from the Old Testament, do not commit adultery. But we're going to be looking, first of all, at Jesus' response to somebody when they are caught in the act of adultery. So we're going to John chapter 8 and from verses 2 to 11. So at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to her, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, sorry, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who, began, who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman who was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I need to confess that this story always riles me slightly because there's no mention whatsoever of the man who was also presumably caught in the act of adultery. It's just the woman that gets hauled in front of this group. And there's two things going on here. The first is they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to figure out what's he going to say. Is he going to go for the side of, of mercy or the side of judgment? And Jesus, of course, doesn't fall into that trap. He knows what's going on and he responds in a completely different way. And the other thing that's happening is that they're trying to shame and punish this woman. And again, Jesus does not do that. So it is a fascinating story. But what happens here is that Jesus, in his creative way, he doesn't engage with this idea of punishment for this woman. Instead, he is sort of scrabbling around, says stooped over in the dirt, writing something in the ground. And we don't know exactly what he's writing, but commentators have had a field day with this. 
And often people think that maybe he was in the ground writing the Ten Commandments. Or perhaps even he was writing down sins that he knew these people, ready to stone the woman, had committed. And that as they saw their sins, or as they saw the Ten Commandments written in the sand, in the dirt, they knew that they were not righteous, that they were not in a position to condemn her. And so, since no one else was able to condemn her, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And this is so important. I really want you to understand this, because as a church, not just as a local church, but as the church throughout the ages and throughout the world, sexual sin particularly is one where we love to condemn people. We love to point the finger and to judge and to punish people and to rule them out. But actually that isn't what Jesus does. He's kind, he is merciful, and he's loving with this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. And so there's something here for me about confession. And this is an important part of dealing with adultery. Like I've said, all of us are prone to infidelity. And maybe that doesn't mean sleeping with someone outside of our marriage, but even the small acts of infidelity we are prone to. And the most important thing is that they're not kept in the dark. They don't stay hidden. It's in the dark that sin multiplies and that we get caught in captivity. But when things are brought into the light, that's where freedom and life abounds. And Jesus' response to this woman is what we can be sure of ourselves. As we confess our sins to God, he does not condemn us. He convicts us, he doesn't condemn us. Condemnation leads to shame. And shame isn't just saying, I've done something wrong. It's saying, I am wrong. I am bad. And that's not what Jesus is about. That's not what he says of us. And in fact, I've got lots of experience of having grown up in church and seeing my peers or seeing people that I know and love who've ended up in some sort of se sexual sin and then it driving a wedge, not only between them and God, but between them and the church and them and their community and them and their friends and ultimately them walking away from their faith. This is a pattern that I've seen time and time again. Shame and things happening in the dark and not being confessed before God ultimately lead for, uh, to a separation from God and a separation from church. And that's not what Jesus wants. So is Jesus then just being, you know, sort of saying, it's all right, don't worry about it, no problem? No, he clearly doesn't say that either. He actually finishes by saying, go now and leave your life of sin. So he's not condemning, but he's definitely not condoning. And so I want to turn to Matthew chapter five, where Jesus in fact is very, very clear about this. And this is a Sermon on the Mount where Jesus took the 10 commandments and kind of expanded them and talks about for his followers, what it really means to live like Jesus. And so he says here, so Matthew five verses 27 to 30, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. So Jesus really isn't messing around when he talks about this. He doesn't say, if your right eye causes you to sin or your right hand causes you to sin, go away, think about it, talk to your friends about it, pray about it, ask for guidance. He doesn't say any of that. He says, cut it off, gouge it out. And what he's talking about here is drastic action, immediate action. He's talking about spiritual surgery. And this isn't because it's a punishment. It's not because they've, someone's done something bad and so they need to be punished. And that's why something's being amputated. It's, it's a preventative measure. Like I said before, people often get to a point where they think, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how I ended up in this affair. And Jesus is saying here, it starts with your mind. It starts with what you're thinking about. You don't do something without having thought about it first. The thought leads to action. Action leads to a habit. Habit leads to character. And it all starts with our mind. 
Now, I love this quote from, it's attributed to Martin, Martin Luther, but often uh, quotes are attributed to people that didn't actually say them. But uh, yeah, I find this really helpful, where apparently Martin Luther said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. So there are going to be these thoughts or these desires that, that fly overhead, temptations that come. You can't stop that. But what you can do is you can stop it making a nest in your head. You can stop it dwelling on it. You can stop feeding it. And so the drastic action for us is about what we're feeding ourselves. What are we watching? Who are we hanging around with? What are the things that are feeding our des desires? And if we are finding ourselves dwelling on um, lustful thoughts, on inappropriate thoughts, and we're finding ourselves gravitating to the wrong people, Jesus is very clear. He says, stop it. Stop it right now. Do what you need to do, whatever it is, to cut off that behaviour. And I want to suggest that he's saying the same thing to you today, and he's saying the same thing to me today. That if you are caught up in some sort of sexual immorality, he is saying to you today, stop it. Don't think about stopping it. Don't talk to your friends about it and, and try to figure out a timeline for stopping this. He says, just stop it and stop it immediately. Now, like I said, God's desire for our life is life and it's freedom. And that is why he is so harsh on this. He doesn't want us to be in captivity. He doesn't want us to get ourselves in situations where we're caught up um, in situations that we're then stuck in. So the first two things are to confess our sins to God and actually to other people. The second is to stop and take drastic action where it's needed. But the third thing, and this really is, it does extend beyond marriage, is to live faithfully. Now, whether we're married or not, Jesus calls us all to live faithfully. And that is about this first thing about having sexual integrity. But the second is about having deep relationships. And if you look at the New Testament, the giants of the New Testament, Jesus and then Paul, they were both single guys, but they were in deep and committed relationships with people. What is faithfulness? So I looked at this up online and some synonyms for faithfulness are loyalty, constancy, devotion, allegiance, commitment, steadfastness and trustworthiness. Each one of us, whether we're married or not, are called to be in relationships which demonstrate those characteristics. There is a call to us in our friendships, in our family relationships, to be those who are faithful to the, to the people we're in relationship with. The third thing is that the spirit of Jesus lives in us. The spirit of Jesus, the spirit of the one who is faithful, lives in us. And so his life uh, not only makes us holy, but gives us the energy to live faithfully in the world, to be committed in our relationships, to be devoted in our relationships. And we're not just about gritting our teeth and trying really hard and doing our best. We believe that we actually can't be faithful without the presence of God, without the life of God in us. And the last thing about living faithfully is where I started at the beginning and I said that one of the reasons that people are unfaithful is because of unmet needs, either in their relationships or just in themselves, a sense of lack. And the reality is that no relationship, no one relationship can ever meet all of our needs. And if we're looking to a spouse or if we're looking to a friend or a family member to meet all of our needs, we're only going to be disappointed. It is an unreasonable ask. And so we have to look to God. He is the only one who can meet all of our needs. We are the beloved of God. He loves us more than we could possibly imagine. And he wants to provide for us in every way. And so any sense of lack that we have in our relationships needs to be brought to God, where he can fill us with his presence, he can fill us with his love. And what, if, what we've been talking about today may have touched on some kind of sore spots for you. There may, you may be aware that your marriage or various relationships are in a difficult situation. And I just want you to know that I have seen and even experienced myself a real transformation in relationships. That when we confess to God where we are, when we choose to take the drastic action and ask for his presence in our lives to help us to live well, 
he will work in miraculous ways and he does work in miraculous ways. I've seen marriages utterly transformed by the presence of Jesus. And if you need some help with this, and of course, as a ministry team, we're very willing to walk alongside you and to point you in the right direction of people who can help. Uh, we're also going to be running a marriage course in the autumn. So if you want some support and to, to unpack this a bit more, then please look towards that. So fi finally, I want to leave you this, with this question. What does it look like for you to live faithfully to God and to live faithfully in your relationships with other people? What does it look like for you to live faithfully in your relationship with God and your relationship with other people? I'm going to ask you just to take that away with you and to kind of mull on it. And in your small groups, you might want to think about that. So we're called to faithfulness in our sexuality. We're called to faithfulness in our relationships to others. We're called to faithfulness in our relationship to God. And we are given faithfulness, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let me pray and then I'll hand back. So Lord God, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you that in your wisdom, you created relationships, you created marriage. And Lord, we acknowledge before you that this is not easy. We acknowledge that so often we lose sight of your view of these things. Lord, that we can get caught up in the mundane, in the daily grind of marriage or relationships, and we can lose sight of who you are and who you've called us to be and what you've called our relationships to look like. And so, God, I pray that you would renew our vision, that you would renew our minds, that you would help us to have that high view of sex and relationships. And Spirit of God, for those of us who are aware of our sin today. Lord, we pray that you would meet us in that place. Lord, that you would meet us with mercy, that you would meet us with forgiveness. And God, that you would restore us. Lord, for those who, particularly today who need mercy and help, may they know your presence with them. And God, will you give wisdom for clear steps forward, for decisive action. So Lord, we commit ourselves into you and into your hands for our sake and for your glory. Amen. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, now we're going to share communion. Now, if you're unprepared for this, can I just suggest that you pause the video for a moment and gather some wine, some bread, maybe you've got grapes for the children uh, so that we can break bread together. So, uh, demanding uh, word that Caroline has shared with us this morning and we felt that it was good to follow that word with this invitation because God doesn't say go away and purify yourselves and then come to me when you've got your faithfulness sorted out he invites us to come to him and be equipped and enabled by him that we might live holy lives Revelation 3 says, listen, Jesus speaking, he says, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loves you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Lamentations 3 says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts as well as our hands 
to God in heaven. Now we're going to take a moment of silence, allowing for the stirring that Caroline's word will have brought to our hearts, the call to faithfulness, radical faithfulness. So I want us to take a moment or two uh, to allow us to confess where we feel we've been unfaithful to God, to ask for his forgiveness, knowing that he offers it. So let's take a moment of silence and then I'll pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So the Apostle Paul in Corinthians writes, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this when you eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just take a moment now to share whatever elements you have at home together. Christ's body broken for us, Christ's blood shed for us. Now let's pray. We give you thanks, God, of peace and justice, that you have made all things to find their unity with you and in you. For you are the life and energy of all that is, and you are making all things new. Without you, meaning is lost and we are estranged. The stars and galaxies, the waters and ocean depths sing your praise. Forest and mountain, yes, even the desert, all proclaim your splendour. With all creation we join the hymn of angels and archangels and all your people of every time and place. Holy, holy, holy. Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In you is our health and our wholeness, the gift of the one who emptied himself. We give you thanks for Jesus, the wounded healer, who by his words and deeds brings new life to all creation. We praise you for his obedience even to the cross where he made death the gateway to glory. We praise you that you raised him to new life and set him on high to pray for us and to bring all things into union with you. So we take these gifts of bread and wine, give thanks and share them. Come Holy Spirit, Take the things and people of earth and make them signs of peace Christ brings by his body and blood. So that we, feeding on him and trusting in him alone, may be led from death to that life 
where strife and envy, falsehood and pride are ended in the Holy Communion of your eternal kingdom. These things we ask in and with and through our Saviour Jesus, the Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. The power of the Father guide you. The wisdom of the Son enlighten you. The working of the Spirit quicken you. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. A reminder again that there is a Zoom chat and pray now and you'll find the link below this video. Goodbye.